Well, good morning and welcome to the city. My name is Pastor Tony, and I'm the pastor of this incredible church here that we call the City Church. Come on, City family. Can we put our hands together for all of our first time in the... Amen. And I also want to welcome all of our online viewers. Church, we have people who are tuning in literally from all over this great nation and different parts of the world, and they view you guys as part of their family. Can we celebrate them on this morning as well and let them know that we appreciate them? Hallelujah. We're just so grateful for you this morning. Um, I, I started a little bit, and I'm not sure if I want to call it a series, but I started something last week where I wanted to have some conversation about some things that, you know, people want to know about. And last week, I kind of kicked it off talking about stress because it, it, it's a topic that so many people are so consumed with and they're looking for answers for. And if you missed that message last week, I encourage you to go online. You can go to our YouTube channel, The City Church. Watch it. I promise you, it will bless you. But this week, I wanted to kind of bring something out that would be a little bit challenging, but it's actually the number two thing. But it's one of those things that, that kind of makes you be like, well, well, hold on a second. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and they started to talk to you or maybe they got all up in your feelings a little bit and then you didn't really want to get into your feelings or get real deep and you were like, well, hold on a second, right? Like, I really don't want to go there quite yet. Well, today's going to be kind of one of those days. So what I want you guys to do is I want you just to close your eyes for a moment. And I just want to pray. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that every person in this room right now God, that they would be open to receive what it is that you want to do in them and through them. That today is a day of freedom. It's a day of liberty. It's a day, God, where we find healing and restoration in our lives. So, Father, right now, God, I pray, Father, for a renewed mind and an open heart. I pray that you would touch our ears, God, so that we would not, so that we can hear the word. But, God, I also pray that you would, you would touch our bodies and our souls so that we won't just hear it. God, we'll do it. God, I know you have great things planned for us because you're a great God. So, Father, speak to us like only you can in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, come on, right? Let's go one more time. So I want to talk to you guys about a subject that is a a highly popularized subject that everyone wants wants to know about, but nobody wants to talk about. It's one of those things that you know you need to do, but you don't want to do because you don't like how it feels when you do it. In fact, it's the number two most discussed topic among Christians and non-Christians. And it's actually the topic of forgiveness. Look, I just seen some of your faces. You were like, dang, I was going to be at home so I could prep for the game. Dang. It's that thing, right? Right. That, that we got to talk about a little bit because it's something that the enemy is using to prevent us from God's purpose and destiny in our lives. But it's not only something for adults, because in my study time, I actually found this to be true. And this was a surprise that amongst middle school and high school students, the number one topic that they want to talk about is the topic of forgiveness. So it's not just about you, it's about the next generation. So when I heard that, I was like, okay, God, I've got my marching orders, let's go. So we're going to talk a little bit about forgiveness on today. And I want you to be excited about forgiveness because forgiveness is something that that can change the trajectory of your life. Forgiveness is actually at the heart of Christianity. In fact, we see in Luke chapter 17, Jesus speaking, And the Bible says that he says to his disciples, I love Jesus. Jesus is just a real one, right? And he says this, it is, and somebody tell me what that next word is, what? It is what? It's impossible. It's not like, well, it could happen. It might happen. It happens to some people, but not others. It says it is impossible that no offenses should come. In other words, he's saying it's impossible for you not to get offended at some point. It is impossible. He said, so it's going to happen. He said, but woe to him through whom they come because offenses hurt. Come on, look at your neighbor say they hurt. Come on, look at the other one say they make you mad. Okay, some of y'all didn't look at the other one. They must be the one that you're mad at. Okay, so so listen, it says woe because listen, they're going to come. 
He said, in the next verse though, he said, but take heed to yourselves. Because if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Oh Lord, that's all I needed. Pastor Tony, I'm ready to go home. Right? If he does something, I can, I can rebuke him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Right? Some of y'all going to get in the car and just start rebuking your spouse as soon as they sit down. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Satan, leave him. Right? right? Like we're going to start just going crazy. Right? We can rebuke him. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. He said, but the problem is, no matter what they've done, if they repent, you got to forgive them. Well, hold on, pastor. I like the rebuke. Can we go back to the rebuke and not really the... It says, and if he sins against you seven times in one day, it says, and seven times in a day returns and says, I'm sorry, you got to forgive him. Whoa. Because for most of us in the room, I can forgive you typically the first time. But the problem is it didn't happen once. It happened again and again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And you kept saying sorry, but you don't mean it. And now I've, I've built up a fence, a wall that you can't get through. But the problem with a wall is not only can they not get through it, neither can God. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about this forgiveness. Because it is very hard. And it's so hard that when Jesus told his disciples this, the first words that came out of their mouth in chapter five was this. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Do you know they never said that in any other instance other than when it came to forgiveness? They just say like, increase our faith so we can heal more people. Increase our faith. They said, forgive God, we need help. We need help. Come on, how many of you would say you need help when it comes to forgiveness, right? We need help. So I said, okay, this is, this is gonna be good for us. Because the disciples are saying we've got to increase our faith. But why were they saying that? They were saying it because offenses come. And sometimes offenses come in small offenses, don't they? Like sometimes, you know, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, I was on my way to go pick up a pair of shoes. I got exclusive access on the fire red cements at JD. So I had to stroll up to Mentor, you know what I'm saying, after prayer. I was on my way up to JD. Had my lady with me. Hey, girl, you want to ride with me? I got to go pick up these tennis shoes. You know, if you come with me, I'm going to get you something too. <laughs> okay, say less. She got in the car. We're on our way driving up the Mentor. And as we're going, I'm in the left lane. And the left lane is called the what lane? Passing lane. Which means in order to pass someone, you must hit your accelerator to get beat past them. If you are not going past them, you belong in the right lane. To which I'm cruising along, got my lady with me. I'm about to go pick up a brand new pair of tennis shoes, you know. I said, well, these are going to be my game shoes in basketball season. And we're trekking along, and this lady sees, I'm, like, I'm, 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 I'm moving at a good, can I use the word, pace. And, and she just merges right out in front of me. Now, now, now she merges out in front of me because, you know, she's thinking there's a car. It's up here, but I'm like, you know, whatever. And, 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 but she doesn't hit the... You know, she just moves over. Now, the good news is I got a, a car, and my car won't let me ride somebody's, you know, back end. I had to get a car to help me with my salvation. <laughs> so it resists, right? It resists. I'm like, it's like, so it maintains a certain distance. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, you know what? I got my lady in the car. I'm chilling. Let me just, you know, ride. And so I'm riding, and she takes like, what felt like 37 miles, because that's how fast I felt like she was going, 37 miles per hour, to pass this car to which at, right before the exit, of course, she merges over to the right, and as I pass her, I see her flipping me off. Now, I just left prayer that morning. I got my woman in the car, and I'm about to have a good experience, I'm about to get some new shoes. And I... I look over, and you know, if you know me, you know me. There were two reactions that could have taken place. The first one would have been one of anger, and I would have gave her that mean mug look like, what? I got my girl in the car. You want to pull over? You know what I'm saying? Like, we could do this. You're the one in the wrong because you shouldn't be in the left lane anyway. But instead, she's flipping me off. I look over past my wife, and I'm like, 
to which she flipped me off two more times. <laughs> I peeled over, got off the exit, got my shoes, didn't ruin my day at all. But how many times has that ruined our day? How many times has something small, like we go to the restaurant, order a Coke, they bring us a Diet Coke, you take that first sip, immediate headache, like, dude, what's up? I wanted a Coke, not a, this is terrible. Sorry for you Diet Coke drinkers. But sometimes it's not little things, it's big things. Am I right? Sometimes the, the offense is not little, it's big. It's big in that, you know, we've been betrayed. Maybe we've been lied to. We've been manipulated or abused. For some of us in the room, we've been discriminated against. Others of us have been abandoned. We've been forgotten or we've even been looked over. So, so I don't know your story or the weight of your story, but God does know, and this is a holy moment right here, guys. See, the worship experience that God gave us this morning was to set us up for this. It's holy right now. And God is in the room, and he wants to do something in you that you've needed him to do for a very long long time. So let's get into the word and let's get into the message a little bit because I want us to pray that God would increase our faith in the process of forgiveness. Would you just put your right hand on your head and say, Father, come on, everybody say, Father, increase my faith in forgiveness. Say it one more time. Father, increase my faith in forgiveness. So let's take a look at what the Bible actually has to say about forgiveness. I want you guys to write down. I see a lot of you got your notebooks. You can take your phone out, take a picture, text on your phone and notes or whatever. But I want you to take a look at these questions and I want us to answer them because I want to go through them as we find our way into freedom. Now, these are going to be true or false statements. So what I want you to do is I want you to write them down and then I want you to answer them to yourself. And the first one is this. Forgiveness is a good idea only when someone deserves it, true or false. Write it down, write it down. Forgiveness is a good idea only when someone deserves it. Number two, forgiving includes minimizing the offense and the pain that it's caused. Forgiving includes minimizing the pain or the offense that it has caused, true or false. Number three, if we choose not to forgive, eventually the issue will just go away. True or false? If we choose not to forgive, eventually the issue will go away. And then finally, number four, if we do not forgive each other, we will not be forgiven. True or false? If we do not forgive each other, we will will not be forgiven. So let's take a look at the first one here. Let's take a look at the first one. Forgiveness is a good idea only when someone deserves it. Is that true or false? Is what? It's false. It's false. It's false. Forgiveness actually has nothing to do with what a person deserves. In fact, it actually has little to do with another person at all. So let me clarify something for you guys today, because forgiveness actually has more to do with your relationship with God than anything else. So today I'm not talking about reconciliation. That's different. Reconciliation takes two. Forgiveness takes you. Did you hear me? So reconciliation takes, forgiveness takes you. So, so we're talking forgiveness on today. So, so we're not talking about that reconciliation. So what does the Bible tell us then about forgiveness? Well, in Colossians 3, chapter 13, the Bible says, bear with each other and forgive one another. Look at what the Bible says, bear with each other, which means you got to work together. You got to bear with each other. You got to work together. But how many of you know working with people? sooner or later, is going to bring an offense. Yes or no? How many of you have been married for over 20 years? Raise your hand. 10 years. Put your hand up. Keep your hands up. Five years. 
All right, now I want you to keep your hand up if you've ever been offended in your marriage. Fellas, put your hand down. Put your hand down, dude. Yes, there you go. So, so listen, if you're gonna be with somebody at some point, no matter who they are or how much you love them, at some point, they're gonna offend you. And, and it says that, listen, you're gonna be together, but you also gotta forgive one another. And it says, and if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive how? As the Lord forgave who? You. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Oh, dang, Jesus. So, so what you're telling me, it's not really about what they deserve. It's actually forgiveness is more about what you've been given. So it's not what they deserve. It's more about what you've been given. Okay, well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Forgiveness is freely received. When you come into a relationship with God, Christ, you freely receive that forgiveness that he has cleansed you, washed you of all of your sin, right? All of it. So it's like, but if it's freely received, then it must be freely given. Okay, okay, come on, y'all. Y'all don't, don't leave me. Look at your neighbor and say, don't leave. So, so what does it actually mean? It means that the hurt and pain are complicated, but I believe it's the truth that will keep it simple because forgiveness actually looks like this. Do any of you fellas or even ladies, you know, in the room, like you, you, you like to put some work in in your yard. You like, you know, you put the work in, you know. I remember when I bought my house, you know, whenever you get something new, you're like, man, you know, and you can tell the people who take care of their yard, they got the lines and it's like green, dark green and light green, edge sidewalks, no grass growing through the cracks of their cement. Any, you guys know what I'm talking about? Perfectly manicured garden, mulch every year, right? Sometimes my stuff is just brown, you know? They would trim that out. But, but when I first got my house, I was like, man, I'm about to, this place is about to be lit. And what I did was I went and I got a new lawnmower. Come on, somebody. I said, well, I'm gonna give me a John Deere tractor because nothing runs like a deer. And then I got me a spreader, Scott spreader, and I was like, you know, I'm going to get all the fertilizers and weed killers, and I'm going to follow the directions. Now, I'd never done this before, guys. So I went and bought me a spreader. I got my fertilizer, and then they said, listen, you ought to overseed your yard so the grass can be thicker. Cause, listen, I want that. So I put the fertilizer in, pushed it around. Now I put the seed in there. And I'm pushing that thing, and what I found is you set the adjustment, but the faster you push, the further it spreads. But I'm going to tell you what I didn't know about the spreader, and it reminded me of forgiveness, that when you're pushing that spreader and you're spreading out that seed everywhere, that as you're pushing it, the seed is also hitting you. And God said, that's a picture of your life. Yeah, you're spreading forgiveness out here, but you're forgetting to forgive yourself. There's seed of forgiveness that's hitting you that you haven't forgiven you. And because you're not willing to forgive you, it's making it very difficult for you to forgive them. Amen. But see, we've got to learn how to forgive ourselves. And when we learn how to forgive ourselves and receive that forgiveness, then we will be able to forgive others quicker. So let's take a look at the second one. Forgiving includes minimizing the offense and the pain that it causes. Is that true or false? It's what? It's false, right? It doesn't, you know, we don't minimize the pain because the event was real. The pain is what? It's real. It's a, this thing is for real. I'm hurt for real. I'm offended for real. I feel it for real. So we don't minimize the pain or act like it doesn't happen. Well, that really didn't happen. But what we do do is we reject our right to repay. So we don't minimize it. I'm sorry. It was terrible. You, what you're feeling is real. It was wrong. And you have a right to repay. We'd be like, well, what is that? Listen, if you read the Old Testament, the Bible said it was eye for an eye. 
If you steal from me, I can steal from you. Sometimes I could cut your hand off. You had a right to repay when you were wrong. But forgiveness is rejecting the right. I'm rejecting the right to repay you what you deserve. Why is that important? Because we can't forgive when we do minimize, because when you minimize, what we do is we fail to acknowledge the real pain behind the offense. We can't fail to acknowledge. But the Bible teaches us this, that any time sin or an offense occurs, a debt is established that requires payment. So every time you sin, today, if you leave here and you lie, if you leave here and you, you sin, a debt is charged. And the Bible says that every debt must be repaid. So when we are offended or we offend somebody, a debt is now put up. There's a debt that is incurred. But this is the crazy thing, because in Hebrews 9.22, it actually says that this is the payment. It says, in fact, the the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with what? Blood, because without the shedding of, there is no forgiveness. So, So there has to be a payment, and the cost of the payment is high. The shedding of blood is the highest payment, guys. It's higher than money. Life is greater than money. You can get more money, you can't get another life. So it said that the payment is high, but without that payment, there is no forgiveness. So so let let me show it to you in this way. This is kind of what it looks like. These are a pair of my shoes, guys. If you know me, you know I'm a sneakerhead. I love shoes, right? I love me some shoes. I told y'all I was on my way to pick up a pair of shoes yesterday. And I got a little shoe collection, you know, um, and, and I, like I said, it's just a passion of mine from when I was a kid. You know, when I was a kid, we, I couldn't have a lot of shoes. You know, I, I grew up in a time where you got one pair of shoes. You know, at the beginning of school, you got your shoes, you know, and I just kept my shoes clean all year long. And, and, if, and if it was good, if it was a good year at home, sometimes at Christmas, you got another pair. But it was a lot of years that that pair you got in the fall you carried with you all the way through the spring. And then in the summertime, you got another pair because that's when your mom got your layaway out at Hills or Kmart. Can I get an amen? Y'all don't even know about layaway. But, but you, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. So coming up, you know, I remember the first pair of Jordans I wanted. My mom was like, brother, I will never spend $100 on a pair of shoes as long as you and I are alive. So when I became an adult, you know, I was like, hey, man, you know, I, I, it's not trauma. I just, I, you know, hey, I like shoes. So I started collecting shoes, and I got shoes. And this is one of my favorite pairs of shoes. These are um, a pair of Jordan 1s. They're, um, it's a collaboration with a, a, a company called Union. They're called the NRG Storm Blue. Blue is one of my favorite colors, which is why the city is blue. And um, these things are super valuable to me. They are. Now they're, they're, they're worth so much more than what I paid for. It's ridiculous. Um, but I wear them, like if you knew what they call, like what they were worth, you'd be like, I can't believe you wear those. But let me tell you, anything that God blesses me with, I don't care how much it costs. If it's nice, I'm going to wear it. If God ever blessed me with a super nice car, it ain't going to be in my garage. I'm going to see it out there. I'm going to drop my stuff. You know what I'm saying? So, so I got these shoes, but let's just pretend for a moment, you know, because I love these, that uh, uh, Lewis, he comes up here and, you know, he, I got my shoes on this table and, and, and he... He, he takes my shoes. He just picks them up and, and he takes them. Now, I can react a couple of different ways. No, probably the first reaction I can do is yell at him. Like, brother, don't you know how valuable those shoes are? Did you wash your hands before you picked up my shoes? Are you crazy? What is wrong with you? Do you? And I could be going off on them. You know what I'm talking about? Or I could do something like this. Man, Dylan, can you believe this, Brother Lewis? And grab my shoes. 
He don't even know what he has in his hand and how valuable these things are. This brother is a thief. He probably is a liar too. You know what I'm saying? If he'll steal, he probably lies. And you know what? The Bible says that that is the Satan. He probably got Satan in him. And we start accusing him and slandering his name to other people. Or I can start to think about revenge. Oh, this brother stole my shoes. Okay. I'm about to go flatten all his tires. I'm going to go steal something from him. I see, I see he liked to set down his phone. I'm going to go grab that phone, slip it in my pocket, throw it in Lake Erie. I'm going I'm to get, get my revenge because this he took something valuable of mine. I'm going to... I'm I'm going to repay. Or I could say, I don't know why this brother took my shoes. I don't know if he need a pair of shoes. But at the end of the day, it's just a pair of shoes. And I've got something greater than anything he could take from me because I've got an intimate relationship with my God. And anything that I lose, God always gives me back something better. Every time I've lost something, the Bible says, and I will repay. And it always comes back greater. So I might have lost these shoes, but God will probably give me another pair of shoes that's even better than these ones. And I've seen God move in that way. Thanks, man. Um, all right, thank you, man. I just had to make sure, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> is, is, is even though we have the right for repayment and we can repay, we've got to learn to reject our right to repay. See, the problem is, is that if I forgive, if I forgive Lewis, if I forgive Joe or Patrick, if I forgive Chase, if I forgive you, the problem is when I forgive you, there's still a debt. And the problem is, is somebody has to incur the debt. And what forgiveness does is it, it causes you to reject repayment. And what you do is you assume the debt. So it does hurt. There is a little weight to it. It is a little uncomfortable. Because now you're carrying a debt that you didn't incur. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said, for just as we share abundantly in the what? Sufferings of Christ. It says that so also our comfort abounds through him, which lets me know that in this life, there's going to be some uncomfortability that you are going to have to assume to be like Jesus. There's some suffering that you're going to have to take on. There's some uncomfortableness that you're going to have to be able to walk in. He said that you ought to take up your cross and what? Walk, not complain, not be like, man, I can't believe they did me like that. Blah, 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 blah. You got to believe that if I'm suffering with him, I'm going to abound with him. That if this has happened and it sucks, God's got something so freaking amazing, it's going to blow my mind when it happens. You know what I'm saying? It's like that. Because God doesn't, he doesn't, listen, repay evil. He repays evil for, with good. So it's like, oh, you did me wrong? Okay, watch this. Watch what God will do with that offense. Take a look at this, Joe. Forgiveness is a form of voluntary suffering. Now, I know that you wanted me to teach you that forgiveness was going to make all the pain go away. But I'm not going to, listen, I'm not going to preach to you a fantasy or a fairy tale. I'm going to preach to you the truth because the Bible says the truth will set you free. Amen? So it's a form of like voluntary suffering. But what it does do is it frees you from the attachment. Why is that important? Take a look at 2 Corinthians 1 and 5. It says this. It says, for... Uh, it says, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comforts abound through him. So, so listen, we, we lost something, but we're going to gain something better. Now, I, I, want you to, I want you to hear me. There is a reason that it's hard to forgive. 
And there's a reason that the enemy wants you to build walls around your heart. This thing, and I need you guys to really lock in, is so much bigger than what you're feeling. See, the enemy, the Bible says, is cunning. He's smart, but he's not creative, which means he uses the same things over and over and over. The problem is he was created, he's not a creator. You are a creator because you were created in his image and likeness, which is why you can have children that look like you. So you're, you are image likeness like him. But watch what the Bible does. Because when we're looking at this third thing, and I want you to answer it, I want you to think about something. If we choose not to forgive, eventually the issue will go away. Is that true or false? That's what the enemy wants you to believe. How many of you in here have heard the statement that time heals all wounds? How many of you, come on, we're going to be real in this place right now. How many of you are dealing with something in your life that time is not healing the wound? So it's a lie, and it comes from the liar. But we are acting like eventually this thing's just going to blow away. And we're sitting here biding our time with bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness in our hearts. It's false. See, time doesn't heal all wounds. Time increases the chasm between you and the offense. All it does is it increases the gap and what that means is it's now you've got to build a bigger, longer bridge to try to get to the other side. So it just makes it harder the longer you wait to get there. It just makes it, it's harder. So, so, so look, at it, look at it from this context. Forgiveness is our pathway to healing. It's our pathway to healing. Acts 3.19 says this repent, then turn to God so that your sins may be what? Wiped out. It says, listen, turn, turn around, go back, forgive, do that. Why? Because when you do, then times of refreshing are going to come. The problem is, is that this unforgiveness has created a toxicity in you. It's, it's, like, it's like if you had a well and the well was polluted or toxic or you had a container that had contaminated liquid in it, it doesn't matter if you pour clean, fresh liquid in it. The contaminated will contaminate what's good. But if you want to be refreshed, you've got to dump out the toxic traits, the toxicity that's in you, and you've got to wash it out and allow new wine to come. That's why the Bible says you can't put new wine in old wine skin. So we've got we've to let this go because it doesn't matter how many messages you hear, how many worship songs, how many times you get in God's presence, if you're putting in that clean, refreshing Holy Spirit, it's still going to be toxic until you're willing to address the unforgiveness. And the devil knows it. And I'm going to show you here because this is going to mess some of us up a little bit. It's going to mess some of us up a little bit because I was like, man, God, I, I, I don't know if I just didn't, like, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Because it's not just about freedom from the thing. God doesn't try to free you from the thing. He's trying to free you from unforgiveness. And why is that important? Because forgiveness leads to life. Unforgiveness leads to death. Watch. Um, how many of you in here have ever seen on HBO or Max, whatever, right now, there's a movie called Unbroken. It's been out for a while. You guys ever seen that movie, Unbroken? It's a tremendous movie. Watch, listen, when you go home, Google it, watch it. Um, it's an incredible movie. It's about a guy who actually was an Olympian here, and he went to the Olympics. He was a great athlete, and uh, World War II broke out. He was getting ready to go to the Olympics for the second time. World War II broke out. He became a pilot. He enlisted in the, in the military, became a pilot, and he was on a mission. And while he was on a mission, actually, his, he had some mechanical whatever, and his plane goes down in the Pacific. And he's actually in a raft with another guy for 42 or 47 days. He's stranded at sea. 
And finally, they see somebody coming. I'm about to be rescued, but he doesn't get rescued by his people. He gets rescued by the enemy. And then the enemy takes him to a war camp in Japan. And because he is well known, and I want you to know, I don't care how insignificant you think you are. You are well known in the heavenlies. And what had happened was they knew who he was, so the Japanese were like, we know this dude is an Olympian. We are going to make an example out of him at this camp. And for two years, they tortured him, beat him, and made him do things to mock him as an example for everybody else. The war ends, and finally he gets to come home, and when he gets home, he becomes an alcoholic in bitterness and hate. For the people who abused him, drive him to a place where he's about to lose everything that's important to him, which is his family. His wife is going to church and invites him to come. I don't need that. I'm not doing that. I'm mad. I'm hurt. I'm offended. But just because he goes, he goes to church and guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing. He goes, he leaves, and I was like, whatever. But somehow he gets invited to a Billy Graham crusade. Thank God for Billy Graham. I'm telling you, our nation is what it is because of what God did in Billy Graham. And he goes to a Billy Graham crusade with thousands of people. And he's sitting there, he's listening, he's like, man, this is dumb. And he's like, I'm going to leave. And he's walking down to leave before it's over. And he said, like, he just blanked out. And by the time he came to, he wasn't walking out. He was walking toward the altar. And he got to the altar, and he lifted up his hands, surrendered his life in that moment. And he said the next words that came out of his mouth was, I forgive him. It's a true, this is a true story. And in the movie, or there's a book on it too, so if you're like to read, he actually is quoted as saying this. If you hate somebody, it's like a boomerang that missed its target and comes back and hits you in the head. The one who hates is the one who hurts. The one who hates is the one who hurts. It says true forgiveness is complete and total. It's, it's actually healing. His name is Louis Zamperini. But there was another quote that I I liked too as it related to forgiveness that was actually written by Lewis Smead. And he said this, he said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free only to discover that the prisoner was you. It was you. (laughs) Which leads me to the last and final point. If you do not forgive each other, you will not be forgiven. True or false? It's true. The enemy will allow you to come here, lift your hands, get baptized, claim to be whatever and whoever you want. But if he can keep you in the bondage of unforgiveness, he knows that God does not have the legal authority to forgive you. So how serious is it? Forgiveness in unforgiveness is a life and death decision. Look at what the Bible says. Don't, you don't, listen, don't, don't be mad at me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also do what? Forgive you. He said, but if you do not forgive others of their sins, your father will not forgive you. He won't. So if the devil 
can keep that fence that you've built around your heart up. He knows in the end, you lose. He already lost, but you lose too. See, the truth is this church, forgiveness is a requirement for, for Christians. So let me land the plane here with a question. How do we forgive? How do we forgive? Well, Jesus kind of showed us in Luke 22, verses 41 and 42, he said this. Jesus is about to be arrested so that he can be crucified on a cross. He goes to a garden with his friends, the disciples. And they're there and he's like, hey, can you guys pray for me, man? I'm, I'm really going through right now. And you know what the disciples did? They go to sleep. Because listen, how many of you, when you close your eyes to pray, you go to sleep? Come on, right? You read your Bible. I always, I always used to tell people, they're like, man, I can't sleep at night. I was like, just open up your Bible. You'll go right to sleep. And the Bible says that in, in, in Matthew uh, 22, 41, it says that when they did that, he withdrew about a stone's throw ahead of them, beyond them. He knelt down, meaning Jesus, and he prayed. And then he said something that we say a lot. And he said, Father, if you're willing, can you take this cup from me? Hey, God, I'm struggling with this. I'm hurt by this. God, th this happened to me. God, is there any way, is there anything you can do right here? Can you rain down fiery coals on their heads? Can you make them my footstool so that I could kick them? But the Bible says that after he said that, he said the thing that we don't like to say. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Why is that important? Because Jesus was trying to show us in that moment that there are some unfair things that are going to happen to you. But you can't focus on what's being done to you. You have to trust in the one who created you. So what does that mean? If we want to learn how to forgive, we've got to resolve that we have to learn how to depend and to trust on God. Well, what does trust look like? This is what trust looks like, church. Trust looks like 10 years ago, a man in another country hearing a word from God, a question that was asked, do you trust me? The man said yes, not knowing what he was saying. And over 10 years ago, the trust of a yes, not my will, but your will, has resulted of a moment on September 10th in a city called Ashtabula with a room filled of people and you being one of them. Hearing a message from an unqualified young man who just loves Jesus. But a message that could set you free because the young man was foolish enough to not get caught up in what has happened, but to believe that God had better things that could happen. See, it ended like this, guys. <laughs> it ended like a man being beaten, tortured, skinned alive on a cross with all the power to repay in his right hand. The Bible says he could have called down legions of angels to prove who he was. You want to mock me, spit on me, tell me like, oh, if you're the son of God. But instead of trying to be right, he decided to be righteous. And the Bible says that in that moment when he could have repaid 
he actually said this, Father, forgive them. While he's bleeding out, they ravaged him. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I know the pain is real. I know what they did was wrong. It w- look at me. It was wrong. You were innocent. It was unjust. It's not right. Won't ever be right. But can you have the courage to in the face of the ones who would crucify you Say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who I am. They don't know what I've been called to do. It's funny. I got this last story and I'm done. I was watching a video as I was doing this message. And it was a pastor who was interviewing a college professor at the school that he had went to for seminary. And he said, You know, as he was interviewing, he's like, hey, you know, this woman was the best Christian he had ever met. She was so excited, so full of joy. She was so, like, merciful. She was like the picture of what a Christian ought to be like. And he was interviewing her, and he said, yeah, you remember when we met? And they had met on a Zoom call. They'd got their syllabus, and she's like, hey, guys, it's so good to see you. Man, God is going to do great things in us, and I'm believing over the next nine weeks that, that, listen, there is going to be some healing and restoration that God is going to do in you to set you guys free. And the pastor was like, hold on, lady. I didn't sign up for that. I'm taking a class because I want to get my seminary degree. I'm paying you. I don't want to talk about my feelings. I just want to do some work. And she said, well, listen, this is what we're going to do. I want everybody in the class to go get a poster board and some sticky notes. And he's laughing and he's like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm gonna go to Walgreens, get a poster board and people are thinking, I'm getting this for my kids and I'm getting it for me. And she said, what I want you to do is I want you to get three colors, you know, green, get a yellow, maybe an orange or a red. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to, on all the green ones, I want you to write down every good thing that's happened in your life and I want you to put it on your board. And then the yellow ones, what I want you to do is I want you to write everything that you're going through right now and I want you to put those on there too. And then with the orange or the red ones, what I want you to do is every bad thing that's happened to you that's hurt you, let you down, or disappointed you, I want you to write it on those red sticky notes and put it on the board. And he said reluctantly he did the project and I don't know, he didn't get into what school it was, but what's crazy was he said that the last day of class they actually met at the school and she was like I want all of you guys to bring your poster boards with you and he said he had to get on a plane so it must have been far and he said he gets on the plane he's like I'm not about to get on a plane with a poster board with sticky notes he said so I folded it up and I put it in my suitcase and he said when we got in the class she said all right guys I want you guys to get your poster boards out and for the next nine hours we're going to talk about your boards. And he was like, mm And she said, but I'm going to go first. And he was like, okay, good. You can go take all nine hours. And she opened up her mouth and he said, I, I'll never forget my whole life. She said this. She said, I grew up as a Christian in a Christian home and I decided to go to college. And when I went to college, I went I was pure. She was a virgin. And three weeks into going to her school, she was kidnapped. She said she went to the school to reach people at the school for Jesus. But three weeks into it, someone kidnapped her. And they chose her because they found out she was a virgin. And over the next two weeks, she said they beat her nearly to death. She literally almost bled to death. They sexually assaulted her. 
over seven times a day for two weeks every day. The mental, physical, and sexual abuse that she described, some of it I actually can't even say on this stage. And then he said, they were in there and everybody's looking at her and everybody was crying. And I'm crying and she's talking. And he said, we're looking at her and we're like, how did you let go? You're so amazing right now. You're, I've never been through what you've been through and you're doing so good. How did you let go? And she said, it wasn't what I let go of. It's what I was holding on to that made the difference. See, so many of us in the room are so focused on the thing instead of the king. We, we've lost our focus. And you got to learn to hold on. Don't hold on to the past. Hold on to the one who redeems the past. That woman has changed her school and thousands of lives because what the devil meant to destroy her, God took it, turned it, and is using it for the good. It's real. So I'm going to ask you this. What is it you're holding on to? And who is it that you need to forgive? So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I want you to know today that God knows it wasn't right, it wasn't fair, but you must forgive. The Bible says in Luke 23, verses 39 through 43, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, that one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him saying, aren't you the Messiah? save yourself in us. And I believe the enemy is hurling insults at you that, well, you're a Christian, you should be okay. So you're pretending to be okay, but I want to let you know it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. And it goes on to say in the scripture that the other criminal who was up there, two criminals, rebuked the one and said, don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for what we are getting, what our deeds would say that we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. See, guys, the punishment that you should, re should or do deserve, you're not going to get. And for some of you, you were innocent. Some of us, let's be honest, we were a contributor. It's us too. It's not just them. It's us. But the Bible says that the one criminal had a revelation. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. God, I'm a criminal and I'm not worthy. But would you please, in this moment right here, forgive me so that I can be with you forever. And the Bible says that Jesus turned to him and answered, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. So as your eyes are closed, I'm gonna ask you right now in this moment to think about all the things that God has forgiven you for. The things you've said, the things you've done, the mistakes you've made, 
the opportunities after opportunities after opportunities, chance after chance after chance. How far has his forgiveness gone with you? And now, I want you to ask God, God, show me who I need to forgive. God, show them to me because I don't want to carry it. I don't want it to separate me from you. I don't want to pretend any longer. God, show me who I need to forgive. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, God, I believe, God, that you are speaking to people right now. You're showing them names and faces of people, God, that they need to just, they need to, they need to forgive them. God, their healing is in this forgiveness. Their victory is in this forgiveness. Their ability to become who you created them to become is in this forgiveness. And God, the relationship they desire with you has been blocked because of this unforgiveness. So Father, right now, God, I pray that you would give them the courage to forgive. God, it's an individual heart thing. They don't need the other person, God. It's them choosing to forgive. So Father, right now, God, I pray that as we are forgiving and our hearts are being purified, that you would give us the courage, the joy like that lady had to walk in that forgiveness. God, I pray right now, Father, that you would take away every lie, in every deceit. And right now, God, I pray that our hearts, our minds, and our ears would hear nothing but truth. We are worthy. We are chosen. We are sons and daughters. We are called. We are anointed. We are difference makers. We are holy because you make us holy. We are qualified because you qualify us. So God, right now, God, I pray that you would just use us. And Father, if there be anybody in the room right now who doesn't know you, God, whose debt has separated them from you, I pray that right now, God, they would receive you as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray that right now in this moment, God, that they would be willing to confess your son, Jesus. In fact, I want everybody to repeat after me. Say, Father, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I've messed up a lot and I don't deserve what you have. But you said, if I confess your son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord, you would forgive me of all my sin. So today I confess Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I believe the debt I incurred, he has paid on the cross. Father, help me to walk worthy of the forgiveness I have received by forgiving those who have offended or hurt me in any way. I want to be like you. I want to walk like you. So thank you for choosing me. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching the City YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss a single video. And feel free to even share this with a friend. You can also support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button below to help us to continue to reach people all around the world for Jesus Christ. We also want you to check the description to learn how you can get connected to our church via a digital connection card, C groups, and many other more exciting events that we have. I wanna thank you guys again for watching. We're so grateful for you, your support, and we can't wait to see you soon.